Welcome to the second episode in the video series about financial modeling in NIME. A very quick recap. Last week we looked at the app design for what I call a minimal viable product. And in a workflow we have completed the data input for plan values and the focus on forecasting revenue for the plan over time. So these two topics we've ticked off already. And what I want to tackle in this video is implementing the functionality to upload a new Excel file from the uh, local drive and also the plan version comparison. So that's the goal for this video. Let me quickly switch the theme and let's do a brief recap on what we achieved last time around. This is the output workflow where we loaded in our plan values, including an overview of products, start and end date for revenue being generated, a frequency, and then the corresponding value. We merged in a data format for the duration that we needed into the same table, iterated over every row to create the correct date range, then add the product information and the value, collect all the results in a loop, sort it by date ascending so that we can nicely look at it in a pivoted format. And we also did a calculation of the totals using group by to validate that our inputs were correct. And all of that was done. The data was loaded from these input value Excel sheet where we have our plan values and our frequency mapping. So that's that. What I want to do next is something at the beginning that we need to change. So let's put this in yellow, upload Excel, let's copy that, save version to do somewhere here. So let's put this one to green for now because it's complete. And these are the three pieces that I will now start working on. I will implement something for the Excel upload and will then be right back and share with you how it all works. I'm back and I've built something. Let's look at it step by step. Let's start with uploading and also now defining the version. That's something that occurred to me later on that if we want to save different versions that we need to have an identifier for each version. So we also need a user input for that. But let's start with the two widgets. Luckily, NIME has very good interactive widgets that already take care of what we need. So we have a file upload widget and a string widget. So the string widget we use for the version, defining the version, and the file upload widget allows us to select a file. So I've configured this, given it a label, choose label, gave us a variable name that gets created data upload limited the valid file extension to just .xlsx. And I've unchecked that this is being saved in the workflow directory just for now, because I have a data file in there already. And this leads to the uploaded file being stored in a temporary folder. And then the, uh, the path and the file name being uh, a bit randomized, but the path to it will still be correct. We'll, we'll see that in a moment. So this then looks like this, where we can select a file. We'll select the input file for now. And um, yeah, then we get, let's actually briefly do that for now. Close and apply temporarily. Now, if we open this, we get the file name, and the um, path to some temporary folder. And you can see this long number that was appended at the end of the file name. So the string widget is fairly straightforward. We give it a label and it defines a variable name. It's just a single line string with no validation or anything. And if we look at that, we can add something like V1 here. Okay. So before we proceed, Let's um, 
merge them both variables into one. So that's what's happening here. And then we connect these variable ports to the two Excel readers. And the Excel readers, the configuration was changed a bit. So we are not uh, going to a hard coded a file on the workspace, but we are passing in under flow variable settings, file selection, the data upload path that our file upload widget generated. And we've done that for both. So now this should nicely execute and we still get exactly the same data. All the same until here. The only thing that I've changed in the column expressions is that I've added an additional column, uh, which is the version column, where I pass in the version of the variable. All other things stay the same. So if we now execute the loop end, we see that the version for now is blank. So let's briefly change that. Let's call this B1. And let's go apply. Yeah, let's keep this new default for now. Let's re-execute. So now we have our version one in here. And what I've done next, I moved the validate piece down here because we don't really need that. And let's now look at the next part. So what I then also thought about that saving the version means that we actually uh, need to append it to any existing data. That's why I uh, have saved a table already, which is uh, the versions revenue planning table that I've created in our current workflow data area. And we'll um, read from that. First concatenate the new version and then uh, we overwrite the existing file. So what I'll do in this first run briefly is just swap this out. Cause obviously in this data, we did not have the version. Now we have it. And now for a second run, I come on connect. Sometimes a bit clunky. We will change something in the file, change the version number, and then check that in addition to version one, we get um, also the version two in there. So let me open up my Excel file. And let's just say that there was a delay in this project. So we start a month later and maybe this contract was extended by another year. So we've made now two changes that should be visible in the new version. Let's save that, close it out. Let's reset all. And now let's go and select our file again. We select the same file, which now contains different data. We apply it for now. We open up version if this version two so eventually what we'll be doing is we will be wrapping these two in a component so that we can do the inputs at the same time and now let's just run this until here so now we have our table with the different version number version two let's load our version one table let's concatenate it Let's briefly check by sorting the version the other way around. So we have B2 in there as well. And now we write it to our new table and I can quickly do the check. I now read the data, we have versions one and two in there. So awesome. That's one step closer to the goal that we want to achieve in this video, which is being able to store different versions and then also compare them to get some insights. So that's what I'll be looking at next. I'll pause for now and I'll be back when I have something to share. Cool. Let's now have a look at how to make the data visualization possible. Shall we? We start by simply loading up the data. That takes the data that we've saved via this table writer 
and we just grab it so it includes all the different versions. As you can see, I go up to version 6 now. Next, we work on the interactive component that will allow us to select two of these versions to compare. That's done using a group by node, which delivers us just one cell that contains a list of all the unique options that we can choose from. The way that that's being done is we do not have any group column, but only have the manual aggregation set up for the version column, and we choose it to aggregate as a set. So that then gives us a list. Next, we turn that into a variable and pass it to the so-called widgets. Widgets allow interactivity in data apps. And I've configured two of these so that we have one for each of the versions. So these widgets are configured using the set flow variable that contains the unique different versions of our data set. So let's see how we configure that. In a bit, in the flow variables tab, of this widget, we assign the set version variable to the default value and also to the possible choices value. So when I now zoom out and I open the view, I have a drop down of the different versions that are available. And this way I can decide which versions I want to compare later on. So for the second one, let's choose a different version. And let's set that as a new default for now, and then we can move on. So next, we are adding a rule-based row filter, which filters for only these two versions, the main data set. And that's been set up using these rules. So basically, if the version number of a certain row is not either the selected first version or the selected second version, then the row is being excluded. After that, we need to wrangle the data into the right format that we want to see. And I'll show you the target visualization that I've selected. I will be using a generic e-charts view for that. And the reason why I've selected that is because there are plenty of examples available that you can easily port across. So for what I want to do today, I've selected this waterfall chart. If I click on the example, we can see the example code. And the way that I want this to work is that I want to have my first selected version on the left as a total revenue, the second selected version on the right as total revenue. And then in between, I want to show as a waterfall the difference in the different revenue categories so that we can easily spot in from which category a certain change in revenue is coming. You can clearly see that this is all JavaScript code and that's good and bad. Obviously it makes it low code, not no code, but it's also very easily adjustable if you wrangle your data into the right format. For example, here you can see the categories that you see across the X axis. And then you can also see the different values that are on the Y axis. Although it is to say that these ones are the invisibles. So these are the values between for each of the categories between the X axis and the bottom of the blue bar. And these are then the values of the blue bars. So we will use this in the end to visualize our data. What do we need for that? We need our, we need in one column, our categories. So that would be at the start, let's say our first version at the end, our second version and then the different revenue categories in between. And we will then need to set up one column that holds the value for the bars that are blue and one column that holds the values for the bars that are transparent. So between here and there. And that's what we need to now do via what I call data wrangling operations. Let's go back to Nime and see how that looks like. So there are two, going to be two streams. The top one deals with the totals for the two versions that were selected. And then there's a bottom one that deals with the differences in revenue for the different categories. So in the end, we end up with one table that has a difference in revenue between the different revenue categories or product names, whatever you want to call that. 
And then we have one which holds a starting value. So that's a 26 K. Next, we join the two data sets by concatenating them. And then I won't go through that in detail. There's a bit of data wrangling going on so that in the end, we end up with a table like this, where we have one column with our starting with version one, finishing with version six and in between the categories. And when then we have the values for the transparent column, as I call them, and then for the colored column, as I call it. And with that, we can then pass it to the eCharts node. And this one is already working. So here we can see how it will look like. But I'll also quickly show you how you can build this up based on the example code. So we grab another eCharts view and open up the configuration menu. At the same time, we go to the example, select all the code and copy it and paste it in. If we now go to the view, we see exactly the example that we've seen on the website and now we can start modifying. What makes this fairly easy is that any of our columns effectively is a list already. So now if I want to replace these example categories with my categories, all I need to do is delete it, make sure that the cursor is in the right place and then double click on my product column. So now we go down and here's a list of the transparent values deleted and double click on the transparent column. And lastly, we do the same for the blue columns, double click. And here we go. We have our chart. So next I want to make sure that this is a interactive component so that I can change any version number and automatically the chart refreshes. So let's remove this one. Let's zoom out a little bit. Let's select all the nodes that we've just created and go click create component. And then we can rename it to data this for example. And if we now open this, we can see that it behaves as expected. So whenever I change the version, my chart refreshes. So that's good. Uh, what I don't like yet is that the two select selection boxes here are stacked on top of each other. I want to have them horizontally next to each other because we don't need this much, much space. And also the other thing that I want to change is to make this chart a bit smaller so that we don't have to scroll. So I want it to fit all on one screen. So let's look into how to do that. We right click on our component, go to component and open it. And now we have the layout editor option. And after clicking on that, it takes a moment to load the layout editor view. And to start with, I clear my layout that moves all the widgets. So that are the two selection widgets and also the generic e charts view back here. And I also have these layout option down here. So I grab a column layout so I move up here and I move the first version in there and the second version in there and our main visualization goes down here. So for the main visualization to not expand so that we need to scroll, we can click this little settings bu button, select auto and then assign min and a min and a max, max height. So let's just play around with some values. Let's say minimum 300 maximum 500 and let's see what that looks like and then go back out find our component expand it. it looks better already but maybe that's a bit too squished so let's just have one more go in the layout editor Max this maybe 500 and this 700 I think that's that's it. I like that. This was a rather quick walkthrough of the workflow. I will also upload the workflow in its current state to the NiHub, so you can find the link in the description below. And you can use that to maybe understand a little bit better the data wrangling operations to get the table into the right format. Just go back in. 
So this piece, maybe. And next time I plan to work on the PNL further. So I want to add direct expenses or so expenses that relate to the products and also indirect expenses. So any company expenses like rent or whatever, so that we get them into the model. And once we have a basic PNL done, I think then there will be at least one more video on the balance sheet side very simplistically so that we can model cash in cash out based on our revenue and cash in cash out based on our expenses as well over time. And then for the minimal viable product, I think that's going to wrap it up then. So thanks a lot for taking the time to watch and I see you next time.